Welcome to the Evolution 2.0 podcast, where we explore the intersection of art, technology, business, biology, and spirituality. Here, you'll discover new trends in evolution that are changing the way we think about everything. This is your host, Perry Marshall, author of Evolution 2.0, 80-20 Sales and Marketing, and guides to Ethernet, Google, and Facebook. I'm founder of the Evolution 2.0 Prize, a quest for the missing link between earth science, the information age, and life itself. Let's join the conversation now. This is Perry Marshall, and I'm here with Frank Visser, and uh, Frank uh, graduated as a psychologist of culture and religion, and he founded a website called IntegralWorld.net in 97. Um, he wears a bunch of interesting hats in his life, and he's author of a book called Ken Wilbur Thought as Passion, and we're here because we're both interested in the precise nature of how theology and religion come uh, and science come together, especially as it relates to origins and biology and evolution. And Frank, um, a couple weeks ago, wrote an article about Ken Welber. He mentioned me in my book and talked about me is sort of straddling these two worlds, um, maybe in a slightly different way than, than Frank does. But I think there's a lot of common ground for conversation. And so that is why we are here today. So, Frank. Yeah. Nice to be here. Welcome. Glad and to have an opportunity here. for uh, speaking with a like-minded spirit um, with differences. But that is uh, what provides the juice. Yeah, well, so wh why don't you, um, I don't think any of my audience is going to be necessarily familiar with your work. Why don't you tell us a little bit of your story? Um, yeah, you mentioned Ken Wilber. Well, this person is an American philosopher, um, uh, a self-trained and self-styled philosopher, um, an unknown celebrity, they call him. Yeah. Uh, he is now his 70, so he had his fame in the 80s and 90s. Uh, that's when I discovered him, actually, in the early 80s. Uh, he is a writer on psychology, spirituality, culture wars, values, clashes. Uh, that's his strong area. Uh, over the years, he has more or less reached out for a, a theory of everything, uh, with a little tongue-in-cheek, of course, because he's not a physicist. But that was exactly his point, that the theory of everything needed to include mind and soul and spirit to be called the theory of everything in the first place. Um, however, the drawback is that his uh, grasp of the sciences of life and matter are far less strong than his uh, knowledge of psychology. Uh, but anyway, I, I studied psychology of religion, so that matched perfectly. Uh, what I did was read his books and try to reach him, um, but he was in the 80s uh, more or less living uh, solitary in the, in the Rocky Mountains near uh, Boulder, uh, mm. didn't respond to any mails and, and phone calls and so on. So that was a pretty hopeless undertaking. Uh, but I worked in the publishing industry those days, so through his publisher I could uh, obtain his fax number. And then I faxed in some questions. And the next day, a huge fax came back with answers. Mm -hmm. And uh, I still have a whole um, um, uh, pile of, of faxes uh, uh, dating from the 80s and back and forth. And it, it, it really sparked. So that was a relationship I built up. And then in the 90s, I, I managed to visit him a couple of times in Boulder in his... Uh, house in the mountains and that was just a, a peak in that part of my life because I, I, I studied these fields, I had been to India, I had chosen the psychology of religion, I wanted to both understand why people believe the things they believe but also experience whatever there is to experience in terms of mysticism, spirit. I was, I was pretty ambitious in those days. Mm. Uh, 
that became a working relationship. I, we decided I would write this book, uh, Thought as Passion, about him first in Dutch. And then uh, somebody from SUNY Press approached me and said, um, that was a funny email. It started like, Frank, you don't know me, but I know you. <laughs> we, we want your book. Yeah. So that was my um, um, kind of um, highlight of my academic career. Hmm. After that, I went to the publishing industry. I, I turned out to be more, uh, I had more pleasure in making things, producing things. So I became production manager, uh, printing and designing books uh, in the field of psychology and spirituality again. And that was until the mid 90s when the internet came along. I discovered that uh, first I was very re resistant because it was the gaming industry that picked it up the first. Uh, later on, I discovered you could use it for bu publishing uh, without the costs of paper and transportation and, and uh, keeping stock. You could reach people in, in Korea and in Brazil just like that. And that sparked my interest to uh, to switch my career to the internet. And uh, actually, I found a job as service manager and, and a support manager. And did have, for 20 years, I've done only that from day one. Mm. Um, and with Ken Wilber, it went a little bit downhill in terms of uh, sympathy and, and mutual respect, mm. uh, especially when I... Um, I started to dig in the fields that he was less familiar with. So biology and evolution uh, was the case in point because actually one of his biggest works from the 90s had as a subtitle, The Spirit of Evolution. And that captured my attention, of course, because I had uh, I'd been in, in movements of theosophy, the esoteric religion. They have their own theories of uh, evolution is kind of a divine process. It is pushed onwards and upwards to a higher complexity and that kind of stuff. And Wilbur made that more sophisticated, I thought. Uh, but it turned out very soon that he had very little grasp of the, the nuts and bolts of evolution. Uh, there was never a link to research or controversies. It was as if he was living in ex abstractions Mm. Uh, he has a famous formula that he says everything in, in, in evolution is a process of transcend and include. So that a molecule transcends an atom, but it includes the atom and so on. You can go to cells and organisms. And, uh, but that is a level of abstraction that is nice, but it never touches um, the nitty gritty stuff and the also the ugly stuff in evolution, the suffering and the, you know, the, the comet that strikes and the dinos are wiped out and so. So mm -hmm. indirectly, because of his weaker approach of that topic, I dived into it head on. And for the past decade, I've literally, uh, well, what I see behind you, I have the same here. It's a, it's a bookish subject. So you I, I have meters of uh, the Dawkins and the Jerry Coins and the and the Mar Lynn Marklis and also the creationists and the uh, intelligent design books. And I'm always triggered by how that matches, uh, but also over the years have moved towards the science part of the, the equation. And I've basically, and that's perhaps a bias I should come up with up front, I've lost uh, any sense of that concepts like design or, or creation, are, they are empty for me because they can never be specified. It's always a kind of placeholder for stuff we don't understand. So I've pushed that out of my uh, horizon um, and I didn't feel the need to introduce it again because um, as you describe in your book, there are so many schools in biology there's so much controversy within the field of science. I feel no need to mix some design into that. The moment you do that, the discussion falls short because um, how is that done? When was that done? By whom was that done? Why was that done? Silence, it can never be answered. 
So it doesn't add to the insight for me in any way to introduce that. But still, I like, I'm still triggered by the recent book of Michael B. Um, who keeps insisting that we need some notion of design, intelligent design, even at the level of molecules. And again, I'm thinking in the back of my head, you can't seriously mean that God is folding up proteins. I mean, that's first very unpractical. And second, it's unworthy of a God. He has higher business on his mind, you would say. Um, and it doesn't give any insight. It's, it's, it's more a negative conclusion. It's, it's, it's by inference. Since we don't understand how it works, it must have been in some other way. Um, I always think like uh, it, it is saying that the DNA molecule curls itself up is implausible to a high degree. But would it be more plausible to say some cosmic spirit is doing this? That's basically my conclusion that as, as complex and, and mysterious the natural processes are, you won't get any new insight by saying this is done by design or this is done by intervention or it is done because the cells want it or the genes try it, all this intentional, intentional language um, doesn't do it for me. That doesn't mean I'm to the opposite field of dump, dumping down everything to chance and laws. But uh, yeah, just as an indication where I stand, I prefer to do real research, listen to the controversy within a, a field. And yeah, I see progress every day there. And of course, as you notice, there are schools dogmatic schools, there are heretics in biology. Uh, yeah, that's, that's the sociology part. That's all unavoidable. Um, but it shouldn't tempt us to say, ah, there is signs of spiritual influences there or something. That goes too far for me. So maybe we could take um, a very recent piece that you wrote called from hydrogen to humanity and I've highlighted some stuff. Let's look at it. Let's talk through it. Um, I think I have a slightly different point of view, although I, I agree. I agree with quite a bit of what you're saying here, actually. Um, and there's kind of a tension here. So shall we? Yeah, sure. So, so um, uh, so I'll, I'll just start from the top. A religious view would say there is mystery at every step. It is impossible to understand the sequence in a naturalistic sense. Um, so I, I'd like to, sh um, I'd like to show you a slide that I made that might give you a, um, maybe a, a, a way that I think about this. Um, so I like to picture a, a car uh, as humanity's search for knowledge and the earth is nature and the sun in this picture here is God. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and so creationism is like, you say, where did this all come from? It came from up there. Okay. And it's like the end of the story. So where did the dinosaurs come from? Where did man come from? Where did the cells come from? Where did the zebras come from? Well, God did it. And well, you know, if you're a scientist and you need to publish a paper, like that's not going to get you real far, you know? So that, that's a picture that's how I would depict creation, creationism. Mm. Um, Darwinism is saying, well, it all came from here. Um, it's just random mutation and natural selection. It's just laws. It's just chance and necessity. 
and you go, well, where does all that light come from? You know, well, it comes from here. It comes from the cloud. It comes from the earth. And there's no external source. That's kind of how I see Darwinism uh, being presented in the world. Yeah, you know, mm. intelligent design is sort of like this. It's sort of like driving towards the horizon. And you say, well, where did this all come from? It's like, well, you see that sun setting in the west? It's there, but you can't get there from here. So it's kind of like creationism, but there's this, you're never quite sure, well, if I drive west, am I going to get closer to it? Like that's kind of the, um, the, uh, the vagueness that you are objecting to. It's like, well, yeah, but this doesn't tell me anything definite. The answer is still way out there somewhere. And we never get to it. Yeah. So that's, that's what this picture is trying Although to do. Although they try to be specific and precise because they go to the level of molecules and genes and, and uh, 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 physiological processes. So it sounds very detailed, but it isn't. And that is the contrast I see in those books. Right. But you leave so, out the sun, but they don't, yeah, they block the sun for the moment because they don't want to discuss that but of right. course the sun is just clouded for them and behind the, the clouds there's still their sun and their god right now um here's how i would describe evolution 2.0 is yes there is a sun and it might be infinitely far away you may never get all the way there and i don't expect science to get you all the way there but the earth is a lot bigger than either the darwinism version either this version or the intelligent design version um if i summarize evolution 2.0 as Darwinists underestimate nature, creationists underestimate God. In other words, from within, each, each one is shortchanging its own worldview. Um, Darwinists dumb down nature. It's like, oh, well, that's, well, you know, you know that eye, you know that eye we've got, you know, it's a really sloppy design. You know, oh, you know, this part of the eye should be in front of this other part. We don't. We don't really like how the retina is put together. Uh, that's obviously a random accident. Or there's all this junk DNA. That's kind of what Darwinism does. Um, intelligent design says, well, this is way too sophisticated for us to ever figure out. So see, it's, it's intelligently designed. It's just intelligently designed. Well, a scientist cannot publish a paper and say, God did it. That settles it. So let's go out for a three martini lunch. Yeah. Right. A scientist can't do that. Right. So why is this view helpful? Well, I, I'll explain it and then I'd like to hear your thoughts. So the earth, the size of the earth in this picture is representing nature and the sophistication of nature and the depth of nature I think nature is much, much more sophisticated than 99% of people give it credit for. It's much more creative. Um, it, there's a lot more layers to it than we currently understand. So why, why do I think we need God? Well, I think we need God as a ground of ultimate source of order. And the, re the reason that, here's the symptom of, of where I think this is actually helpful to a scientist. So first of all, in my picture, I would like the sun to be infinitely far away. Mm -hmm. Like, 
I am not saying that you can get there from here. And I am acknowledging that I am inferring it. Mm -hmm. But what I'm saying is that even if in nature is turtles all the way down, even if it's almost infinitely deep, even if there's another subatomic particle and another one and another one and another one and another one, that in that sense of, you know, that infinite focal point, it's orderly. It's structured. It obeys rules. And you, you can expect the next layer to be orderly and the next layer or to be orderly, the next layer to be orderly because God made the universe that way. Mm -hmm. And what Darwinists do, which I find extremely disingenuous, is they go, hey, you know, I think 97% of your DNA is junk. And hey, you know, I know the universe really looks fine-tuned, but, you know, there's a trillion, trillion universes, and we just live in the lucky one, and all the other ones, or most of the other ones, are just garbage. And natural selection just got us to this one. I think yeah, that's yeah, a yeah. terrible scientific theory. Yeah, it's not it's, it's, economical. It's, 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 it's fine to have a multiverse, but if that's your reason for having a multiverse, that's a really crappy reason to have a multiverse. Yeah. It's, it, 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 there's no economy in it. There's no elegance in it. Yeah. So God is reason for us to believe that the equations are going to be elegant. So, so you need your God for the fine tuning of the universe, but yeah. not for any biological specific problem. Well, so, so I think, so the fine tuning of the universe is one level of causation that we have to account for. But the other level of causation that we have to account for is codes and intelligence in biology. And we don't know of any way of getting codes and intelligence without starting with intelligence. And that's why I have a $5 million technology prize. Yeah. Um, and, and so, so I, th I mean, if I wanted to make, I don't like God of the gaps arguments. In other words, I don't particularly like this picture. I think this picture cripples a scientist even as it tries to help him. But I don't like this picture either. I think this picture has some really serious flaws. So back to this picture, um, I, I can make as good a God of the gaps argument as anybody. I have a $5 million prize. I have judges from Harvard, Oxford, and MIT. I've presented this at major universities, but I don't say you can't figure this out. Hmm. You may be able to figure it out, but if you're going to figure it out, you're going to have to presume that the universe is orderly or maybe even more fine tuned than we already think it is. Mm -hmm. um, that that kind of assumption is what's actually going to solve your problem. So that, that's my thesis. I think I've, I've probably stated it pretty succinctly right there. Okay. Now it's funny because the, the, the sun in your first slide, uh, on my website, I, I chose 20 years ago as some kind of um, background visual behind my uh, site's name, and it was the sun. So that's a deep symbol of light and warmth. Um, and in, in a real way, we depend on the sun, not only because we make our rounds around it every day or every year, uh, but the light, especially the, the high quality energy that comes from it is used by plants in any and every way we are dependent on it. In fact, it is as good as a God you could wish for when it comes to where does the energy come from that we all use to live and to and, and in the, even the gasoline in our cars and everything yeah. uh, the earth is an offshoot of processes uh, during the time the sun was formed so the, the, the sun is is a symbol for that um a very strong symbol it, almost godlike uh, although it is material um so i, I would never drop that out of the picture even in a scientific view um 
um, in big history and schools like that, they, they insist that energy flows drive the whole show. And without energy flows, if you stop eating, you drop that. Um, nothing of significance would happen. So um, that is an element I would still want to include in a scientific view. Um, mm -hmm. But of course, you, you use it for a divine reality. Um, yeah, I agree yeah. with you that multiverses are very um, uneconomical. Uh, you need a whole lot of them to explain the particular universe we, we live in. I just am content not to know an answer to that question. My only um, um, hesitation here is to say that the idea of fine-tuning has the same problems as the ideas of design. How would you possibly implement that? Um, in the article you, you, you showed, I have this um, cartoon of a Cosmotron. With yeah, let's, let's, show, let's put that on the screen. Yeah. There and we go. There are, I believe, 60 parameters to be fine-tuned to, to get a universe going. That makes it even more impossible, in fact. Um, my mind goes blank about these questions. So practically, I've become an atheist, as you would phrase it. And um, I realize that it doesn't disturb, disturb me at all for the moment. Um, yeah, it is what, what it is. And I, I think the infinity of the universe is impressive enough. I don't need anything else. Um, saying that something behind it, put it there, is, again, quite an empty statement for me, but that's personal. Well, so I approach this question as an engineer. And so what I say is, well, if I was going to build a model of the universe, how would I build it? And so if I had the most amazing computer that you could ever imagine, and I was going to model the universe in a computer, and I had a software program, that software program would have a control panel that looks just like this picture. Mm -hmm. And so, in my mind, it's not possible to realistically conceptualize the universe without thinking of it much the way that you've drawn it here. And, and I, I don't have the ability to imagine how you would get something like that without an act of an in intentionality. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't, I, don't, I don't see any other way to conceptualize it. Okay. Do you? Um, the thing is a bit like um, y you are um, an engineer and you bring your expertise. I, I've always been in the design industry, book design and, and web design. Yeah. And of course, intelligent design uses the concept of design. Now, the yeah. thing with design is it's a mental part. It's a physical part. The mental part is you have to come up with the idea that a header in, a, in an article is uh, 60 points. It's green and it, is, has, is, uh, it has padding around it, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But then somebody needs to implement it. Otherwise, you don't have design. And yeah. in intelligent design, this is never discussed. How could this possibly be implemented. There are no factories, there are no demigods, there are no whatever you need to get these genes do what they're supposed to do or these molecules fold as they're supposed to fold, species uh, speciate as they're supposed to split. It's impossible. It doesn't work. You know what I mean? So design sounds fine, but it is... Um, illusory because it it needs an implementation to work if it's blood clotting or it's whatever is brought up as an example of of um, a, a complexity that cannot have been evolved but <laughs> design is fine and sexy but you need to implement it so so here's here's where i see that how you make that question practical. So I got sucked into this in 2004 
when my younger brother went from being a missionary to almost being an atheist. And we get in this argument. And I go, all right, how, Brian, you, you know, look at the hand at the end of your arm. You don't, you don't actually think this is an accumulation of random accidents, do you? And he's like, wait a minute. And he just comes back at me with a pretty standard Darwinian answer. And he, so when he said that, here's what I thought. He, so I knew that many biologists just reject the notion of design. We don't need that. All we need is Darwinian mechanisms. And I knew that I didn't know very much about all those Darwinian mechanisms. And I knew that those biologists can't be stupid. So there must be something I don't know. But the other thing I knew was, in five and a half years of engineering school, the, the idea that you would optimize an engineering design through a purely chance Darwinian process was never even mentioned once in any class that I ever took. And I thought to myself, okay, if you can get a hand without any intentionality or without any design, then there must be a whole branch of engineering that I don't know about. What do the biologists know that I don't know? Well, well I'm going to find out. Mm -hmm. And so I went down the rabbit hole. But could it be that we are not machines, but we are organisms and organisms have offspring and they grow and they evolve. So the analogy with machines or technology or like saying the eye is a camera, but it is like a camera. It is not a camera. It doesn't have film in it or a digital whatever technology. So be careful with analogies from technology. Well, okay, okay but... But, see, see, I say, you don't understand something until you can build it. If you can build something and it works, then you can say you understand it. So you say, yeah. well, well, we're, you know, we're not machines. Well, actually, I agree we're not machines. But if we, under, if we really understood the human body, we could make eyes. If, if, a, if a guy lost his eye in an industrial accident, and if we really understood biology, if we really did understand it, we'd be able to make that guy an eye. And we can't. And our engineering designs don't do what eyes do. They don't do it. So camera, I got a camera on my phone. Now, I think an eye is a camera. I mean, you have to decide how you're going to define it, but it's got a lens, it's got focal lengths, it's got something that, it, it's got something to turn the light rays into a signal. I mean, and, I, and I've got, I've got a, a camera in my pocket. Now, iPhone is a really impressive device, but this camera is not going to last 80 years. This will. Mm -hmm. And so as an engineer... I think it's preposterous to say there's not design in biology. The real question is, where does it come from? And so when I, when I went down this rabbit hole, I said, well, so do the biologists know something the engineers don't know? Do the engineers know something the biologists don't know? And, and the answer I came up with was... But you were saying it's preposterous to say the eye is not designed. Well, it, it exhibits all kinds of aspects of design. And what, yeah. what the... What, what the Darwinists are saying is random mutation plus natural selection equals appearance of design. Yeah. So even if you say it appears to be designed, okay, fine. It appears to be designed. But the question is, does random mutation and natural selection actually do that? Yeah. Well, in engineering, they don't. I mean, there, there isn't a software company in the world that writes their software with genetic algorithms. Yeah. They well, all okay. have. Let's, let's follow that through. So if the eye is designed, is the final eye designed or is the evolving eye designed or is the light sensitive cell 500 million years back designed? Well, so I, I think I, the, I, 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 I met, met a brick wall here. Uh, well, 
so I see it as being kind of fractal, okay? The organism designs itself. And I think that's very, it's very clear that this happens. You put, you put bacteria in antibiotics and they will rearrange their DNA and some of them will survive by, I mean, they'll go and do massive um, rates of mutation and they, they'll do incredible amounts of mobile genetic elements, horizontal yeah, gene yeah. transfer. They'll do all kinds of stuff. They, they are not doing it when they're in the normal circumstances, but when they're under stress, they start, they start redesigning themselves. And so what, what I concluded was the cells know something that neither the engineers nor the biologists know. Mm -hmm. And it actually pushes the question way deeper than most people ever really even imagined. Yeah. But then are you saying that primitive cell was designed and all that followed on it? Well, have evolved? So, so I don't know. And that's why I have a prize. Okay. Like the prize says, we don't know. We'll write a check for any answer that actually meets the spec. So, you could have several possible answers. One possible answer could be God wrote the genetic code like a computer programmer. And that's how an engineer would typically think. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now I'm not, I'm not, I used to think that way. I'm not so sure about that actually. Okay. Another, another answer could be the big bang was such a perfect billiard shot mm -hmm. um so precise that you know that one initial event resulted in the genetic code and the first cell and all of that okay that would be another possibility it took it took some time right right okay and now the right another condition and the right another, condition. right it's it's a fine-tuning argument is what that is okay Another, a third version could be the universe is an endowed with some level of consciousness, which is embodied in cells. And so life evolves. And I imagine, I haven't really studied Ken Wilber that much, but I imagine that Ken Wilber is saying something maybe in that department. But I anyway, know there's three possible models that one mm -hmm. can pursue. Um, But with, I, 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 I'm not super fond of the model that says, well, God just programmed it like a programmer because I don't like God of the gaps arguments for all the reasons you don't. Hmm. But I still, I, still, I still see an inevitable, as an engineer, I can't even conceptualize how you get all of this without an initial act of intentionality. Yeah. I, I've, I've certainly never seen a model that works without intentionality. Yeah. Uh, my take would be more from the other opposite end that things happen under the right circumstances. So we have life on earth, but we don't see it on Pluto. Why? Um, as soon as you introduce some transcendental power or person or factor, you are forced to decide why did that power beam on earth and not on Pluto or why even on our galaxy, because there are so many other galaxies, we cannot even be found. So there's a whole organizational thing behind that. If you just say, well, we see stuff happen only under the right circumstances. You, you stay close to home and you don't say more than you can know. And you get pretty far with that. Well, so, you, know, you, you can't go for ultimate answers that way, but that's probably also not something that's feasible, I think. Well, so, so that's why I've drawn this picture where the earth is very large. You don't know how large it is. And what that is saying is, I don't know how big nature is. I don't know how deep it goes. I, you know, I don't know how many layers there are, but 
I believe if I can drive my car west in every mile I can drive that car, I learn more and more and more about nature. Mm-hmm. But there, there is an inf- somewhere out there, I don't know how far away it is, I don't know how many layers out there, there is an ultimate source of order and intentionality that this is purposeful. Mm. Now, I can't tell you, well, why is there no life on Pluto? I mean, I could give you a perfect scientific answer to why there's not life on Pluto. I can't give you a theological answer to why there's not life on Pluto, but I don't feel particularly like I need to answer that question. Um, well, I think... Um, go, it, go ahead. The, the theological answer was fitting in a world where the earth was flat, where the sky above us had stars to lighten, lighten up us, and it was kind of cozy and, and homely. But now that we know that the, the cosmos is so much bigger, um, it becomes a different story, because whatever there is behind the Big Bang, to my mind, is very far from a personal God that is interested in us or in some peoples on earth. It is probably a very hellish, purely energetic, horrendous reality, even in a, in a black hole or even in our very sun, you don't want to be there. It's fusion. It's, 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 you know what I mean? So it's easy to say, well, there must be something behind everything. But do you really think that that something, whatever it is, can interfere with us or contact us or is interested in us? That's where, where I drop off. Well, so, so one way of, of restating what you just said might be, so why be a theist instead of a deist? Right? Yeah. Right? Um, you're, you're asking the question, well, wh- why would you think that God is actually active in the world instead of being an incomprehensible, um, impersonal absolute. Big Bang source? Right? Yeah. yeah. Right. And even why be a deist instead of a, a, a scientist? Why not go all the way? You know what I mean? Well... You make room for science, science in, in, in fact, infinitely, because you say, I don't know how deep that rabbit hole goes. It might okay. be infinite. Well, so... Somebody who has dig, dug up the rabbit hole. That's your point. Well, so what you're saying is the earth is infinitely big and there is no sun. No, am I, that's not what I'm saying. That, that, that's how I hear what you uh, in your Yeah. In my, in my analogy. Yeah. Right? Well, so, okay, so, so here, here's, why, here's why I need something at an infinite radius. Is Kurt Gödel's incompleteness theorem. No logical... Sp- all logical systems rely on something outside the system that you have to assume but cannot prove. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, if there's nothing outside the system, the system is illogical. The system mm-hmm. is inconsistent. So you can have a infinitely large cosmos that exists with nothing outside of itself if the cosmos is irrational. Mm. That's what Gödel's incompleteness theorem says. Mm-hmm. But I say, well, this, is, this goes back to why I need a sun. If you have an infinite, indivisible, boundless entity outside of space and time, and the cosmos depends on it, then the infinite, boundless thing on the outside is the, is an axiom. It's the one thing you have to assume but cannot prove. And then you have a logical, rational cosmos, and then you can practice science. Okay. But, but I think, think a scientist thing. would agree that the manifest cosmos might very well be, have emerged from 
a vacuum or an unmanifest cosmos or whatever quantum layer of reality you can imagine. What I'm saying is that so-called nothingness, like uh, Lawrence Krauss' book about uh, a universe from nothing, is, is a so-called nothingness. But why would that be in any way similar to the gods we invented a millennia ago and you know we have stories about and miracle stories and and even to this day people who 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 uh, speak to that reality there is no well, connection for me well so what if we made that the subject of a different recording <laughs> like yeah, yeah, we have to I go would, to biology because I would I would be happy to explain why I'm a Christian and discuss all of that. That just seems like a somewhat of a different conversation than the one we're having right now. Like yeah, yeah. for okay. today, for today I'm perfectly happy to have an infinitely far away deist god and why do I personalize it to being a Christian? Maybe that's a, a later conversation. How does oh, that? Okay. Um, then my question would be in your, your book subtitle, you say breaking the deadlock between Darwin and design. Yeah. But yeah. you're not doing that by mixing Darwin with design, right? You are opening up the field in the middle where all these schools of biology are quarreling and discussing and, 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 finger pointing and, 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 and um, um, uh, studying nature. Um, I think I, I, I agree on the same playing field. There is no question about it. Um, but the extremes we should avoid. Well, I think the, the chance only, um, which is, I think, a, a, um, um, something nobody really believes in. It's more a straw man than something else because <laughs> even selection is non-random. Not everything gets selected. Well, right? well, true, but, but even the mutation process is not random either. Yeah, but not that, always, not always. Well, I wouldn't it's, say it's never random because random means, in my understanding, not with a foresight as to what might help the organism or whatever um, purpose. I, so, I, I noticed you have a lot of uh, appendices in your book about randomness, and that's interesting, but you, you draw it much into the mathematical direction. Uh, right. I think the, the definition of randomness is more qualitatively in biology, that it says it, it, it might have a, a pattern, these mutations, but it is not in principle meant to give the giraffe its long neck or give the whale its long fins. That's what's not uh, at the level of mutations or genes a reality they can respond to. So, uh, But the selection is because the giraffe with the longest neck survives and that's how giraffes get longer necks so there's no randomness there there so that's well, it's a straw man to say uh darwin is in fact passe because that's chance and now we know better well that's so not true darwin is still the foundation let let me give you an analogy that uh of how i see organisms adapting so I imagine you probably have KFC, Kentucky Fried Chicken, and Holland just like you do everywhere else in the world. Um, anyway, it's a chick chicken restaurant, very famous in Asia and the United States. And um, the way that that company started was this guy had a restaurant on a on a on a highway in the entrance ramp, the exit ramp on the highway got closed for construction for six months. Which yeah. restaurant was that? KFC. Oh, yeah, yeah. Kentucky Fried Chicken. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So Colonel Sanders, you know, so Colonel Sanders has this restaurant and road construction basically killed his restaurant and he went out of business. Okay. And uh, he had to eat somehow. And so he decided to go sell his chicken recipe 
um, he'd try to license it to other restaurants. And he, all he had was a car and a social security check. He was sleeping in his car. And what he would do is he would go to restaurants and he, he would, he would walk, he'd walk into the kitchen of the restaurant and he would say, hi, I bet my fried chicken is better than yours. Let's have a cook off. And, um, and so a lot of times the restaurant owner would go, well, okay. And so they would do this chicken making contest. This was how he ate. <laughs> this is actually how he got fed with, with the other guy's chicken, you know? Yeah. yeah. And, and, um, and uh, Colonel Sanders was on a no salt diet for 30 years. Um, uh, by the way, a photocopier salesman who used to sell to Colonel Sanders told me this story. And um, so Colonel Sanders didn't have salt in his chicken. And this one guy, it was a bar. The, the guy took a bite of chicken. He said, this doesn't have enough salt. And he dumped a bunch of salt on it. And then he took another bite. And he goes, whoa, okay, this is good. He goes, if you add salt to this thing, I'm in. And that's how Kentucky Fried Chicken started. And the box says, when Colonel Sanders added the 11th spice to his chicken recipe, he knew he had a winner. Now, Colonel Sanders hated, hated the, the recipe because he couldn't eat salt, but everybody else liked it. And so that's how we got Kentucky Fried Chicken. So, I, so if you say, was the Kentucky Fried Chicken recipe random or not random? That is just like asking if a giraffe neck is random or if uh, a certain resistance to antibiotics is random. I see evolution as being very, very similar to entrepreneurship. I mean, I'm a business consultant. Is when disasters come like, you know, they close down construction and your restaurant goes out of business. It's just like people yeah. scrambling around like, what am I going to do here? And they come up with something. But it's, it's not, so you could have never predicted it in advance. Like that story I told you, you could have never predicted that in advance. In that sense, it's sort of random. But from the standpoint of agency of a being who is trying to make their way in the world, it's not random. It's serendipitous. And, and, and so I, in Evolution 2.0, I try to use the word random in an absolutely rigorous fashion so that we can say what we mean by it and what we don't mean by it. And I think evolution is serendipitous. And I also think it's intelligent. I, I think cells are intelligent. I think giraffe physiology is intelligent. And, and that the intelligence is intrinsic. It's like consciousness. I, yeah. I, th I, think, I think the evolutionary question is actually a question of consciousness, which, as you well know, because you're, you read the ph philosophical literature, like, we're really stuck on that one. Yeah. But so, I would prefer then to say that intelligence and consciousness are evolved products instead of being the cause of evolution. And that's the difference between a religious view that... No stops uh, uh, puts it at the beginning as an explanation and a scientific view says well the hydrogen atom wasn't intelligent or compassionate or perceptive but an elephant is mm -hmm. so this is the the, the 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 task we need to explain how did we get from there to here well and that's right the, the, the religious person will insist that from the beginning, it was all there or it was put in uh, in matter. And the scientific person will say, let's break it up in smaller steps and see how far we come. And this elephant evolved from another uh, mammal. And that evolved from another mammal. And all these steps can be reconstructed. And that's a more uh, a fruitful approach, I think. Uh, I can give you an example from Ken Wilber. He is, he is the religious person who says, well, evolution itself is evidence for spirit for me because how else would dirt rise up and wrote po write poetry? 
Mm -hmm. I think that's a very dishonest claim because first he cannot explain how then this F, uh, uh, in fact worked. But second, um, if you break that up in steps, of course, Dirt did not write poetry on the same day. Dirt formed molecules, molecules formed cells and so on. And then a whole lot later, um, uh, some apes uh, walked uh, uh, on land in Africa and then language came and then metaphors. And when you have metaphors, you have poetry. So there's a whole sequence of steps. You need to really honestly investigate before you make transcendental claims. That's basically the, the, the beef I have with Ken Wilber, that he refuses to go into the details and the steps and keeps hammering on that point that without a transcendental cause, nothing of any significance would have happened. And that is for me an empty claim because you cannot substantiate it. Even if it feels meaningful, but that's an old, another ball game. That's not science. So, so Frank, what, one of the things that I really want to do and hope to do is take this problem, like, t tell, tell me if I'm hearing you right. You're saying because Ken Wilber is not dealing with the particular nature of these steps, he is drawing an unwarranted conclusion from the present to the transcendent. It's premature. It's premature, right? And so yeah. I'm trying to avoid that mistake. Yeah, I appreciate that. And, and, and so the way that, the way that I, so, so here's, here's, but playing devil's advocate with Ken Wilber for a second. I framed the question this way. I said, I have never seen anything evolve to anything meaningful without somebody doing something intentional. So I, I could take genetic algorithms. I could take a bucket of sand. I could, I cannot get what humans regard as design without somebody doing something intentional. Mm -hmm. I've never seen it happen. Okay. And I reduced it to show me a process that gets you from chemicals to code, because if you can solve that, like if you can solve that problem one time at one level, maybe you have the fractal pattern for solving everything else. But, but you have to be able to get a symbol. You have to be able to get representation of code. It's simpler than a cell. It's almost more fundamental than a cell. And that's why we have a prize. And I am yeah. totally in favor of somebody winning the prize. Yeah. Uh, because, because I don't... So I don't like it when a creationist says, God did it, that settles it, we're done. I don't like that. And I don't like it when Richard Dawkins says, well, it was a happy chemical accident. Mm. It's like, we, you know, we, have, we have to solve this problem before we have an answer. But the, but the fact that nobody's won the prize and nobody solved this problem. I mean, this problem has been written about for a long time, the information problem in biology. Mm. Until somebody solves the information problem in biology, you can't just, you haven't solved the design problem in biology. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, uh, like what Paul Davis said, that uh, life took 4 billion years to do that and we might not have enough time to replicate that. I'm not sure if that is true. But um, the other thing is, I, I do feel that you put Dawkins in some kind of caricature way, um, as if he explains everything as a happy accident. I think in the context of that statement, it was meant like, where did the universe come from? Or where, where did life come from? The origi origin of life. 
but when it comes to the the millions of species and animal and plant and 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 and, and that that level of taxonomy he would never say it's a happy accident he would say it's it's variation and selection so that and that in fact breaks another br um, deadlock between always claiming either design by the divine reality or meaningless chance random chance that is a that is a real deadlock and darwin broke that because he said it's a two-step process it's variation and selection and there is no purpose and plan involved but it is able to produce the diversity of life well you can say i don't believe that or it is refuted or it is backward or it's it's passe but i don't see you have that discussion well so my response to that is, yes, organisms evolve. But we don't know how to build things that evolve that way. We, if, 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 I, if I take a, if, if I take a um, let's say I have a, a computer-aided design program that was used to design this phone or some piece of software, I cannot take a purposeless Darwinian process and evolve software to be better software, not if it has any significant amount of complexity. Okay, but <laughs> apparently nature knows how to do that. Yeah, so what does nature know that we don't? Yeah. Darwin did not figure it out. All, Darwin only identified the exterior of the process. Nobody's actually figured this out. Well, he, what he figured out was the algorithm that given that you have variation and reproduction and scarcity and selection, you get this result. Even if he didn't know about genetics and genes and Mendel and all that came later, the algorithm, and, and, and that's another technical concept you would appreciate, is still uh, but, there. But he, 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 didn't, he didn't discover... He didn't figure out the algorithm. He figured out the question that defined, like, I agree there's something like an algorithm going on. We still don't know what it is. If, if we did, Microsoft wouldn't need 10,000 software programmers. Yeah. Why, why, why doesn't Microsoft use random mutation and natural selection to write windows i don't know because computers are not wetware they are they are hardware i mean it's different different substance or whatever i don't know right so we we don't know so we don't know what we know how hardware works we yeah. don't know how wetware works not really yeah so we're just guessing with metaphors like the heart is a pump and the eye is a camera and e every time we we create an artifact in a machine, we think we understand it. And right. in fact, yeah, we, we, the brain is a computer. That was the metaphor in the 80s and 90s, until it was found out that it is in, in a lot of ways not like a computer, or perhaps right. not like the computer of those days, and so on and so on. Basically, we are stuck with metaphors, and we cannot do anything else. But that doesn't... That, that, that is not an argument against Darwin, in my understanding. Well, so I, I think Darwin, Darwin really unearthed a question, not an answer. I don't think Darwin actually answered his own question. I don't think origin of, well, for that matter, objectively, I can show you that Darwin's explanation for where species originate isn't really where they originate. Yeah. Darwin yeah. thought it was random variation. Well, it's actually symbiogenesis and hybridization that creates. No, species. no, no, I, I, I disagree. Um, Margulis, and that's, that's perhaps another session. Um, I met her when she was uh, here giving a lecture in the, in the Darwin, the Darwin year. And I, it was a wonderful woman. And, she was really on fire. Um, and I started reading her books and I, I again was floored by, by the, 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 the dimensions that were opened by her. But she is not a refutation of Darwin. 
she is addressing a different level of taxonomy. What Darwin did for species, Margulis did for whole kingdoms. It's just a completely different level. Well, so, so, and especially, uh, let me finish. And, 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 and I know she had to battle her whole life to get a hearing for her ideas. And lucky for her, she lived to see that it was accepted. But then I think she went overboard and said, and symbiosis is also what drives speciation. And that's not true. That is not supported by the majority of biologists because that's well, a different so, level of taxonomy. Well, well so I, I agree with everything you just said, but hybridization, so um, emmer wheats plus goat grass equals modern wheat, for example. Yeah. Th that is, that kind of mechanism is actually how you get new species. If, if, if no, you that is human selection we're doing. We're, we're, we're culturing uh, natural species into something we like because it's bigger and apples are more shiny and the cabbage is bigger and that's, that's what we do. But hybridization happens in the wild too. I, I'm sure, just, sure. I'm just explaining. But I would not this. say that is the rule. It is, it's the exception that proves the rule, I think. And I, I object to saying uh, Margulis introduced uh, the more feminine values like corporation, symbiosis, and Darwin was all about competition and survival of the fittest. And that is kind of passe. And it, 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 that is wrong on, on multiple counts. Um, and and <laughs> Margulis said, in fact, that the, the very reason we have plants and animals is because some bacteria d failed to digest other bacteria and kept them wi within their bodies uh, to discover that they provided energy. That is not a cozy symbiosis. That is just a, 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 almost a cannibalism. I mean, it is just what glasses you put on uh, to look at these things. And, and the other thing, Darwin is not all competition. In fact, he... He, he, uh, you might as well say, uh, uh, um, Dawkins actually said that this, his book, The Selfish Gene, he, he, he had second thoughts about calling it The Selfish Gene because it, 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 it connected selfishness with the whole subject. He said, I, I, would have, I should have gone for the title, The Immortal Gene. Hmm. So this is all... Uh, um, uh, a battle of mer metaphors and, and, and misunderstanding. But I think genes for social behavior are as Darwinian as genes for selfish behavior. It's unrelated to either selfish or unselfish behavior. The point of Dawkins was that it is the genes that matter and not something else. Now you can argue with that. You can say, no, there are other elements of, of selection, but he did not say we are born to be selfish. That is, that is pop science. Well, okay. well I had to tell so, you that. So I think we've, we've had a, a pretty interesting conversation. I think this has been useful. Um, so wh where would you like to take it from here? Um, actually, um, it's funny because your book title, Evolution 2.0, um, it struck me that um, um, this is usually called the extended synthesis or the postmodern synthesis. And this is in, in contrast to the modern synthesis, which brought Darwin and Mendel together. Um, you could even say that Darwin himself forged a synthesis. So the, this is the third one we're seeing and you, you call it 2.1, uh, 2.0. It's actually 3.0, but anyway, I understand you need a catchy book title. Um, <laughs> and this, this extended synthesis, the question is, does that contradict the foundation of Darwin? I don't think so. Or is it just a refinement or an enrichment or a complication perhaps so, um, so uh, the, I, I the, 
the book uh, the tangled tree of david Quammen. I, I recently read it and you've had him on your program um yes. i listened to that and i i i noticed that um you had a different understanding of the 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 horizontal gene tra uh, transfer um, as if you got excited and say, ah, see, here are, here's stuff going on Darwin didn't know and, and Dawkins doesn't know and he doesn't tell that in his book, The Greatest Show on Earth. And mm -hmm. um, Common said, it's just more variation selection can work on. And that is a Darwinian statement. Well, Even in such an advanced topic as horizontal gene transfer, and it is, it is fabulous, and Carl Woes again addressed a deeper level, even deeper than Margulis. He, he went to the, the domain level and not the kingdoms or the species. But it is not contradicting Darwin. So I think, I think Darwin's original theory, as you see in Origin of Species, was actually pretty good. Okay? I think um, the whole entire evolutionary theory took a big step backwards with the Weizmann barrier and to a lesser degree, the central dogma. And I think the modern synthesis was in many ways inferior to Darwin's original theory. Yes, mm -hmm. it had population genetics, but the assumption was that it's random. It's not, even the variation is not random. Uh, the assumption was that information flows one way. No, it flows both ways. Um, and, uh, you know, Darwin even talked about gemules, which today you could very reasonably label as exosomes. Um, and, and so um, I think Darwin actually was surprisingly right. Um, and, um, and people later turned the modern synthesis into sort of a, a pop religion. Um, so I don't, I, I don't want to sound like I'm trying too hard to take away from Darwin. I think the guy deserves some credit, but I, I think, I think that, that the source of variation is the question like natural selection. That's easy. Like it's not even really all that profound, but it's how do you generate variations? Wetware generates a kind of variations yeah. that hardware and software do yeah. not. So we have a mystery there. Uh, the difference between you and, and the standard uh, model is perhaps that you say uh, next to random variation or whatever, there is also intentional variation. Yes. And that's why in my article, perhaps you can show the diagram where I, on the left, I, I, um, I name the, the more spiritual principles and on the right, you have the more material principles yes here you see intention is on the left um yeah um uh, i take that as a spiritual explanation not in a, in a, in any cosmic or transcendental sense but you're saying what organisms or cells or genes want or perceive or do or need should also be taken into account i absolutely that is, that's a central point of your book um yes. I, I would not know how a cell or a gene could possibly know anything, but I understand that it is a good metaphor to say as if they know. Uh, Dennett in his latest book had the, the a nice phrase that he said, earlier organisms and life have competence without comprehension. They do a lot of things good. That's not to say they know what they're doing. Well, yeah, I think our, well, body I does, our body does a lot of things. We don't even know what the, our bodies are doing. Um, but it goes too far to say like your stomach knows what it should do. That's a whole, whole different kind of knowing than we are used to. But I do understand that is your, perhaps your original contribution in your book that you say we should also look at that as part of the bigger explanation, the intention of cells, organs, organisms, and so on. It, but then it, I still have the idea of the giraffe. If the giraffe needs a, a, lo a longer neck, 
he can wish as long as he wants, but that is not going to give him a longer neck. So in evolution, that won't work. Uh, perhaps in the short term, microbiological uh, Petri dish kind of situation, that would work. But I still can't think of how microbes could possibly know what they need. Well, we, we certainly have to use the word no in quotes. Yes. And there could be any number of different levels and forms of consciousness. Um, I, uh, so here, here's a, maybe a useful picture. You know, if, if we go to YouTube and we type in uh, white blood cells chasing germs around, you know, we, mm-hmm. can, we can find. And in my mind, watching that white blood cell chase germs around and eat them doesn't look any different than my dog chasing a rabbit in my backyard. It looks exactly the same. And, and, and so, you know, like, well, I know my dog is self-aware. It's not as self-aware as I am, but like if she peed on the floor and she looks at yeah. funny, you know, yeah, so I, know. I, I really don't know. Like, okay. So if you go down, like, um, uh, Christoph, uh, Koch wrote a book called, um, consciousness confessions of, re- uh, of a romantic reduction reductionist. And, I know him and uh, he talks about bees and he says, you know what, as a consciousness researcher, I think bees are conscious beings. Um, You know, I talk to beekeepers, I go look at what's going on. And so, yeah, I think, I think nature has a level of self-awareness and I think this is one of the key features of the difference between hardware and wetware. And Mm -hmm. so I, Maybe it's just a convenience, but I I lump it into consciousness because it's this general general topic that we are so profoundly ignorant about. Like, you know, you said, how could we know what a bacteria, how how do we know what a bacteria can know? Well, how do I know what I know? Like, I don't even know, like, I'm, I don't know for sure that you're having a conscious experience inside your head just like I am, but I'm pretty sure I think you are. Hmm. You know, hmm. and I, I think, I think that it, we're dealing with that level of mystery with biology and evolution. And, you know, so maybe you could even reduce, you could say, well, let's not talk about design. Let's talk about consciousness. I think you could have an equally meaningful kind of Yeah, that, that's, that's an even bigger story. And, and, and um, I would still not say consciousness is the same as self-consciousness. So, that might be a, li- a really a later invention of nature. Um, and then even uh, Ken Wilber would probably say consciousness goes all the way down to the lowest level. Um, you mean like to uh, the molecule? Yes, because he would say they respond to similar molecules. And of course, between quotes, you could say that is a kind of perception. He follows a Whitehead's process philosophy and that is something White had uh, had uh, had taught. In it feels a little bit like begging the question to me. Um, again, that is the thing I have with Wilbur that he says uh, there is a drive between everything, and that explains everything. But then it explains precisely nothing for me, if you know what I mean. Yeah, I understand. Uh, so yeah, I was uh, energized by the way you included all these schools in your book. I was a little bit put off by the polemic against Darwin and Dawkins and the hardcore neo-Darwinists because I've learned a lot from them as well, especially the two-step process of variation and selection. But I do know that there have been so many postmodern um, developments uh, Ivo Divo was one I mentioned that in my review. Yeah. And Nick Lane, actually, the guy who uh, wrote a book about origin of life, he is specifically targeting Margulis about the endo- endosymbiosis moment in evolution. Uh, so there's a lot of, again, a lot of movement in that area as well. Um, it's fascinating. I don't think it it refutes Darwin that I keep saying this. I think that is still the foundation. 
<clears throat> and um, yeah. Well, this has been good. I had fun. I'm glad we could do this. I th I felt it was a worthwhile experiment. Yes. I'm glad you decided to talk to me today. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. You're welcome. Until next time, this is the Evolution 2.0 podcast, bridging science, technology, business, and the big questions. To ensure you never miss an episode, subscribe on iTunes or on your preferred player. If you like the show, rate us on iTunes. Join our email list and social media at CosmicFingerprints.com. Evolution 2.0